Well, for nearly 23 years, Nigeria has had a consistent democratic governance. In its simplest term, democracy is the government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Now, as simple as that definition looks, well, it's been a far, you know, distant reality to the average Nigerian. At best, scholars describe Nigeria's democracy as a pseudo-democracy well, the constituent parts of a normal democratic government not getting involved as much as they should. But is democracy deep enough in the country to lead Nigeria to the next level? Welcome to VSA. I'm Sulaiman. Good to be back again. Many thanks uh, to my colleagues, uh, Felicity and Tolu uh, for holding forth. Now, to the business of the day, deepening democracy. Now, in the world, this requires every aspect of nationhood to come together to make democracy work. Now, the sovereignty of the people is of utmost importance. The rights of the minority and the power of the majority are important aspects of a good democracy. Now, respecting human rights, the right to vote and be voted for, the quality of elections conducted, the law, the constitution, social, economic, and even political pluralism are all key factors. How does this improve Nigeria's democracy and how is the ruling APC in Nigeria an example to others? Now, the 2023 elections are ahead of us and the issues of internal democracy, civil liberty, press freedom, the voting franchise, and the quality of representation have all become even more topical. How can democracy be improved? Joining me to talk now is uh, Rukawa Ogumba. She's the president and founder of Jesu Marie Empowerment Foundation, and Taiwo Akirale, who's the country director of Policy House International. He joins me via Zoom. Uh, uh, Dr. Ruki and uh, Taiwo, good to have both of you. Let, let, let's start with you. You were a member, uh, once again, good to see you, and uh, you were a member of the accreditation committee of your party, that's the All Progressives Congress uh, at the convention. What were your takeaways, uh, you know, at the convention? Thanks, Sulai. Good to see you again. I know the last time we are here, we are talking about a different topic. I'm sure we are broaching that. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I'm very proud of my party. I think uh, we had the hugely successful um, convention, national convention, with all the skeptics. And, um, you know, we had postponed it a couple of times. And, um, and um, it was, um, you know, people were thinking it wouldn't happen. And then not even when it happened, how, as peacefully as it happened. And to be honest, what you saw came because there was a lot of behind the scenes action. Okay, even at the time, Mr. President had to cut short a trip just to come back to organize the party because we had very severe crisis internal um, um, party politics and then of course like you said at the end Mr. President likes a peaceful situation and um, he actually really wanted us to agree so the first thing that was done was the um, zoning of the offices so there was a committee that was inaugurated to do the zoning and that actually did the main work to harmonize and unite the party so every leader in this zone now had to decide which offices they wanted to take. For example, South South would now have, you know, a, a few states in that. And then each of the leaders in the states would decide, okay, we want this position or that position. We want, um, you know, like that. And so with that, when we zoned it like that, everybody agreed that we now chose the people that we thought would mm. represent us adequately. So with that, everybody signed a list, a unity list, and that harmonized a lot of people. And of course, going into the convention, we had to do accreditation. I'm sure you know what happened uh, with Zamfara. We didn't want the case of that. When um, you know, I excluded that whole state because um, the delegates uh, were not really accepted. And we know that um, INEC had come with you know, some rules, and there were lots of lawsuits and countersuits. And so at some states, we decided only statutory de delegates who vote. And even so, even till the night of the, um, of the um, convention, we we're still doing that work and excluding certain states so that even if there were 
properly elected delegates in case there was a court case that you know, invalidated them, it didn't affect us. Because again, we're working with utilities, so regardless of the numbers, we had enough people to vote mm -hmm. and agree on this. And actually on the night, most of the uh, election went on, oh, the eyes have it, because there was no other contest, because people had dropped. Even, I'm sure you, the day before you saw people campaigning for chairmanship and they wanted the contest, in the end, we had no contest. But again, uh, before we come to uh, Tywa Kirli, uh, you're a medical doctor and also we've seen, uh, you know, quite a number of, uh, you know, uh, professionals making uh, their foray into politics and that explains why uh, this uh, issue uh, is very important, talking about how we can deepen democracy. We've also seen uh, a very young Nigerian uh, a lady. I, I recall then, uh, just after the International Women's Day, you were in the forefront with some other women talking about women representation. So how excited are you now that you have a, a woman leader, quite young, and a professional too? She's a physician like me. Hmm. So I'm very excited about Beta Adu, is the person you're talking about. She's a national woman leader. She's only 36 years old. And so that's what speaks to the party. We're bringing fresh blood into the situation. We want young people. We want us to own what we're saying. Okay, so the leaders are us right now. To be honest, and um, we want people who are in touch with people who can bring in more people. You know what it is, is about leadership and competence. That's what we're looking for in 2023, more than even political party. So I think in this election, you're going to see that people are going to vote more on the lines of who is representing the party. So we have to be very careful who we choose as our leaders. Mm. And so I'm very excited for my party, um, the National uh, Publicity Secretary, which is really number three in the hierarchy of um, the party structure, is actually from Delta State. Um, he's a very, <laughs> very, um, I'm sure he'll be here one of these days, um, he's a very astute um, um, barrister who has been on the ground for a long time. I'm talking about Felix um, Mocha, mm. and um, he's going to be the face of the party. And uh, he's very well ground, grounded, uh, you know. So, so talking about our party politics, our leadership, our leadership has never been, I think, more united and strong. And um, we want to elect people who can win elections. We don't just want to endorse people who no, can. No, 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 no. So, I, I, and of course, of course, more women. You know, more I'm women. very interested. We'll, 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 yeah. we'll come back to you. Let's yeah. quickly go to Taiwa Kerele. Taiwa, good to see you, and thanks for your time. You're one of those uh, very few Nigerians. Uh, I think lately you were in the news. Uh, you had some books published, and also uh, that's that, the occasion of your birth there. And uh, just after that, uh, you gave an expose of how your journey into politics, mainstream politics, began. And quite an interesting one. Younger Africans watching would like to know how, how they also can be a part of uh, the democratic process in their various communities. Uh, let us in on, you know, for instance, looking at the change of leadership in the APC, uh, well, that has actually changed a lot of things, listening uh, to Dr. Ruki. But uh, coming to you, uh, uh, Taiwo, what are those indices uh, people watching should look out for when we talk about deepening democracy in Nigeria and in other parts of the continent? Thank you, Suleiman, and uh, I'm so excited to be part of this uh, program this evening. Uh, I haven't missed out in the previous edition. I'm happy to be part of this. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, the truth of the matter is that, you know, in, in 1999, when Nigeria was transiting from the military, military rule to democratic uh, rule, there was a lot of skepticism among the civil society, among the civilian populace, as to the sincerity of the military in terms of uh, the transition program. So a lot of people you know, didn't participate because of what happened between 1991, 1992, 93, when the June 12th election was annulled. And of course, we saw how the Babangida administration took nine years you know, in, in, in transiting to civilian regime. So, so a lot of people were actually uh, excused or they excused themselves from participating in the uh, in the democratic process that led to the 1999 uh, handover. But ever, ever since then, the last 20 years, a lot has happened you know, in Nigerian democ uh, democratic system and the ecosystem. A lot has happened. Um, right now, the political parties are deepening their resolve. Everybody's becoming aware of electoral reforms. 
uh, there's much more popular participation among the youths. Before now, those who emerge as youth leaders used to be in their 50s and 60s. But today, um, particularly among the major political parties, you can see that genuine youth leaders are emerging uh, in, a fairly con in a fairly contest uh, uh, convention. And, uh, you know, women are generally participating. The atmosphere is getting wider. The political environment is getting more interesting. And, you know, there's even more gender inclusiveness uh, right now. And there's much more popular participation. Um, you could see what happened during the, the struggle for electoral reforms. You know, civil society were very active. In fact, the Nigerian parliament partnered with the civil society to ensure that uh, there is electronic uh, transmission of a result. It was a very well heated debate. And of course, the people won that uh, debate. So generally, the, the political environment is expanding, is becoming more healthier. We have less assassination attempts these days in the political environment. And uh, the political parties are even much more aware of the electoral law uh, as a result of what happened to you know, APC in uh, Zamfara and of course uh, in uh, Rivers. Most of the political parties are now much more aware and conversant with the electoral reforms, electoral, electoral laws. Nobody wants to get into, the, into trouble with the judiciary and of course with the INEC. And uh, I'm also very excited to know that INEC has also learned a lot uh, in terms of the electoral process um, right now, the timetable is very clear, and INEC is, you know, has invested a lot in, you know, voter education. You could see that there's continuous voter registration of youth, young people who have not registered, you know, since they turned 18. So for me, I think I haven't witnessed what happened between 1993 and now. I'm very happy that today it is no longer the democracy that we, we witnessed in 1999, uh, between 1999, 2003, 2003, that we are now seeing today. Before now, you used to see a very powerful president who can, you know, manipulate the, the House of Assembly to remove a governor. Six people can remove a governor, and it, it has to take the intervention of the Supreme Court to overturn such decisions. Um, you can see the case of uh, Plateau State. We also remember the case of Baeza. But today, the situation has changed. The president that we have right now, having been in government as a, as a military leader, uh, also now understand that his, this is a democracy. And substantially, he has complied with democratic principles by not interfering with what is happening in the electoral process. To see the case, so many cases of Zamfara, Edo, Baeza, where the opposition won. And even when the judiciary intervened, there was no, there was no interference. So for me, I think we need to give kudos to the Buhari regime for respecting democratic principles. For let, let, democracy. let me jump in here, Taiwo, before I, I yeah. come back to the studios uh, with uh, Dr. Ruke. You know. Uh, how can how can listening to you the the, the big question you know yeah. uh, is how can democracy be improved especially in terms of the involvement of every constituent uh, you know of a typical democratic society see the truth is that abraham lincoln told us that politics is the government of the people by the people and for the people so the people are actually the you know, they, they're actually the custodian of democratic practice all over the world. So it is the responsibility of the citizens to understand that the power of government belongs to them. It is they that they elect that we finally come back to govern them. So the quality of people you vote into power determines the quality of services you get. So it is incumbent on the citizens, on the masses to understand that politicians cannot survive. Politicians cannot be voted into power if you sell your vote. If you sell your vote for 2,000 Naira, if you will live with it for the next four years. And at the end of the day, the political, the political class will end up using that power that you have given to them to perpetrate themselves in office. So if you vote a low quality person in government, you should be ready to live with that low quality representation for many years to come. So the people have very significant role to play. But it's also about authoritative allocation of resources. According to uh, 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 David Houston, Politics is the authoritative allocation of resources. So the quality of persons who vote into power will determine the quality of your healthcare system, the quality of your basic education, the quality of your skills acquisition, quality of your infrastructure. So the people have the responsibility to wake up from political slumber, quote and unquote. And this I don't care attitude has to be jettisoned. Because today, Nigeria is where we are as a result of the quality of people, the, quality, the, the, the decision we have taken in the last 15 to 20 years. You know, I'm an advocate of zero, zero out of school children in Nigeria. Today, we have 10 million children that are out of school. It's as a result of the choice, as a result of the quality of people who have voted into power. 
if the people who have voted into power don't understand the importance of basic education, the importance of sending children to school, the importance of supporting women, the, the importance of, of supporting SMEs, for people to have economic empowerment to end up, I mean, to be able to send their children to school, then we'll live with it. So for me, it is, it, everything is comprehensive, you know, the, from, from the electoral process to the voting process to, of course, the declaration of result to the coalition sector, every process matter. So let me, let me, let me jump in again, uh, but this time, uh, uh, tower, uh, uh, a minute, just allow me, allow me, Barton, apologies, yeah. I'll come back to you. Uh, let me bring in Dr. Ricky here, listening to him, some of the key things again, that uh, he's reminded everyone that democracy is about the people, the people, the people. Uh, and if a section of the people are aggrieved, for instance, uh, th th there are some who left that convention uh, with grousers, and uh, people are asking, how can these people be included? You know, they have to be listened to. Uh, the key thing, uh, one of the key issues your party was able to do was zoning of the executive committee positions, which was a big, major one at the event. Uh, why did the APC decide to do this? For peace and harmony, as you know, if we go to a contest, everybody who feels they can serve, we contest. And the truth is, even if you lost an election, does not mean you're not going to participate in that same office because you have something to offer. You have to work with whoever got elected. So it's not over. There's room for everybody to do the work. Like I said, because um, of different factions, you know, you know, different states have internal crises and whatnot, uh, Mr. President, in his wisdom, decided that they set up an election zoning committee with the leaders who can agree to say, okay, for example, national chairman goes to here, and publicity secretary goes to here like that. And so with that, the leaders of those places came together. And like I said, um, our deputy president was one of the people in that committee. And so I you know, I know some of the inner workings because, again, he was the co-chairman of the accreditation committee, which uh, Malam El Rafai, the governor of Kaduna, was the chairman of that committee. So from that zoning committee to the accreditation committee, I think that's what was maybe 99% of the work of this convention. Because first of all, you have to decide who is going to be elected then who can vote? So this is the zoning committee and the accreditation committee. And so with that resolved before the convention day, we had a very seamless um, convention. Yeah. Now, people who would have really wanted to serve in the office, not everybody that would, even if we had a contest as it were, not everybody will win. But what's the point of fighting when we have a bigger fight, when we have a national elections coming up, where we have to fight the opposition um, to get into elected positions. I waste our energy on the, on the smaller chip, if you know what I mean. We need to, to unite to get to that point. And so again, I really have to applaud um, the president. Again, I heard him talking about electoral reforms. Mr. President has to be given a lot of credit for that because electoral reforms, you know, haven't been done for, for since 1999. And so you can see the work that's been done is very, very deep in your democracy, as you said. But more importantly, in the APC, we still have internal um, deepening our own democracy and in uniting people in our own house. Because but we it, also it, it, it's really important yes. because if people, if, if there are grouses and and uh, Tyro said something about uh, voter education uh, that the people are more aware now, political parties are more aware. For instance, your party. You know, haven't been burnt more than once. Now you know know better. You know how to go about with. We've burnt, but we have 22 <laughs> out of 36 <laughs> states, so <laughs> we are still leading. Well, <laughs> I think and we're going to get more states this time, uh, including Delta. No, you 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 have this interaction, this conversation with the people, your constituents. Yeah. How much of an understanding do they have with some of the key things we're discussing at the moment? Talking about, for instance, the zoning. Uh, the grouses, uh, the concerns raised by party people, because it comes back to what Taiwo has said, reminding everyone that democracy is about the people. Politics is always local, you know that, right? So if you want to serve, you, your people have to send you. And if you're a true leader, your people know you and they know what you can do. So you, you have to have a political resume, if you will. And so with that, the people will be more accepting of your leadership and whoever they put. So. Gone are the days where leaders would just impose people on people because it wouldn't work. Because, like you said, you want to win elections. You want to win all, all the um, positions that you get um, and put up for. And so for that, the people have to know you. And so the leaders, 
again, like you said, if you, you like somebody who dashed you 2,000 naira or a bag of rice, and that's all they're going to do for you for another four years, then you're going to be stuck with that. Good luck to you. So we don't want that anymore. We want people who are vibrant, who know the issues, who actually are not hungry people, who are balanced. Politics is not a cheap business. It's expensive. So people who are putting themselves up for positions um, need to have supporters. So you don't have to be a very rich man, but you have to have supporters who can put you up. So there are many, many factors that will make this a seamless process. People, like you said, you know, it's for the people, by the people, for the people. You know, now I'm talking so, about, so. To, sorry again, <laughs> I, I don't mean to put in there, but yeah. again, you said something that I want to try, Taiwo, saying that yeah. politics isn't cheap. But Taiwo, having both of you, you know, it, it will be a complete waste if I don't ask this question. Is politics truly dirty? Um, Suleiman. Any process or any act that involves human nature, that involves human being, there is always element of dirtiness. There's always element of people soiling their hands. There's always element of competition. I think it is that unhealthy competition that people regard as the dirty part of politics. Um, and she talked about uh, trying to minimize, you know, trying to minimize conflict and crisis in the APC that accounted for why they opted for for a consensus uh, option. Um, really, politics is not, it's not, it's not healthy for people who don't have the heart. If you don't have the heart to serve, to serve your people you know, with passion and commitment, you, know, you might be discouraged because there's a lot of monslinging that goes in, in politics. There's a lot of monslinging, there's a lot of you know, name calling, insults and everything. But if you are really genuinely ready to serve your people, those are, you know, those are some of the miles that, you know, are planted along your way towards victory, towards your service to the people. So for me, we have to discountenance the idea of politics is dirty, because if we all say politics is dirty and good people don't participate in it, sub-Saharan Africa and, of course, Nigeria will continue to be in deep shit. But we have to discountenance that. We have to encourage ourselves that the only way Africa can be liberated, the only way we can you know, rejuvenate the African economy is to disregard some of those elements of uh, debt, element of uh, name calling, element of uh, brick back. You, you, and come you know, but, but and before please. before we call, you, you, yeah. we, we call for the break. Uh, let me ask you this, and it's more personal. And uh, having asked if politics is dirty, uh, what also readily comes to mind uh, are people like you, Dr. Ruki, and people of principle and character. Uh, your last you know, political appointment was uh, chief of staff to the Edo State Governor. And people were amazed when you voluntarily resigned your appointment. How does this come into the mix of those who would really want to go into politics and to serve? And at what point in time uh, will they have that you know, conflict right inside of them and say, Wait a minute, this is not what I thought it was. I think I, I'm going to take a break. Yes, um, that my resignation was very instructive because sometimes a lot of things happen in government that conflicts with your principles, as your personal principles and philosophy. You know, there are certain things that you believe in. There are certain orientation you had growing up. There are certain things you imbibe, certain cultural values that you imbibe growing up, either in school or you know, what you learn from your mentors, what you read in books. And when you are not in government, when you are not in politics, you are seeing contrary views as to what you were trained to believe. Then if those conflict with you and you are not elected and you are maybe you are appointed and you are not on, in the, on the same page with the people that are elected or the government you are serving, of course, it is honorable to leave. There's nothing wrong in resigning from government. There's nothing wrong in saying, no, I cannot continue this way. In fact, it will, it will give you respect. It will show that you are not desperate to be in government. It will also show that you have your principles, you have your values, you are there for service. And if the essence, the objective, the reason, the task of your being in government is being defeated, you have no reason or justification to continue to be there. And since I left government, the respect, the honor I have gotten all over the world, are, in fact, is unprecedented. And I want to encourage young people, when you are given assignment, you are given a political appointment, and you have your principles to serve, you have the principles to achieve some certain objective, and you get into government and you discover that 
what you are seeing is different, is, is, a, is, on, is in conflict with what you believe in, then you have no business continuing to be there. There's nothing wrong in walking away. There's nothing wrong in walking away from, you know, from a particular system that you're not comfortable with. All right, Taiwo, we'll, we'll, we'll take, we'll, we'll take a moment, Taiwo. We'll, we'll come back. I'll, I'll come back. Well, we'll come back here on the square. I'll be uh, a little bit more personal, you know, with you and uh, Dr. Ruki, knowing that both of you are professionals and looking into 2023 elections, what Nigerians should be looking up, uh, you know, uh, to get in and how can uh, such, you know, democratic, uh, you know, tendencies and importance can be brought to bear as uh, they elect uh, their next uh, leaders. Uh, that's when we return. Stay with us. If you just joined us, you're welcome. You're watching Village Square Africa here on New Central Television, broadcasting live to 54 African countries and beyond. And today we're looking at Nigeria's democracy as the country prepares for the next general election. And uh, joining me today is uh, Dr. Rukemo Gumbe and uh, Taiwo Akirali, uh, two great Nigerians uh, who are professionals also in politics. But quickly here, before we went on that break, uh, Dr. Riki, uh, listening to both of you, uh, do you think Nigerians trust the processes enough to be involved in politics uh, like yourself and Taiwo? It's, it's improving. I would, I would say there's still a lot of skepticism. Obviously, you saw the um, electoral reforms and even trying to include more people. You saw diaspora voting was voted down. Um, quotas for women were voted down. So many things that we wanted to see um, initially to make people more inspired to get involved. We're not really included, but it's a working process. But even what we have now is far better than what we had before. Like I say, we're deeply in the things. The thing is about awareness, you know, the, the awareness campaign to let people know. I was somewhere today, actually, and, and they said, look, what are they telling me about to vote? We can't eat, we don't have food. So why should I care? It's like, that's the more reason you should care because the people who make decisions for you are the people who probably will be responsible for you eating all your taxes or whatnot. So the more angry you are, actually, the more you should be more invested in this. Because like you said, the power rests to you. Our Taiwo said that, you understand? So you, the, the constituents need to know that they are the ones actually putting the people in office. And you can put them out of office. You can, you can put them out, you understand? So, so that's what it is. So talking about it, letting them know what the gains of electing competence is, and letting them know that actually it's not business as usual. This government has done a lot, more than any government so far in the how many years of democracy, to make sure that it's more equitable. You know that they said if you're in an appointed position, you must resign that position before you start your campaign. That's, that's a level playing field right there because you can come with all your big, big, mighty office and everybody intimidate everyone. And it, you may not be the best candidate, but because you have so much... Um, at your disposal in terms of resources and even security and whatnot, you, you know, you may, you may get in because the people um, cannot really have, like I said. So, so this, this, this time, I think, will be one of the best and fairest elections of our time. I think the young people are very keen to, to, to um, get involved. I, I really want to see more young people actually pick up forms and get elected. Um, as I said, it's expensive business, but we really don't want you to be discouraged because you're not standing alone. Barack Obama raised in the worst recession the highest amount of money from one or two dollars donations from hundreds of millions of people. So it doesn't have to be a lot of money. Pepco for social media, you can set up um, GoFundMe, 
there's so many, many ways you can get people to, to be involved in, in, your, in your fight to get elected. Like I said, no matter how cheap it is, you still have to have billboards, you have to have handbills, you have to go around. You know, it's, it's expensive. And to go depends on what you're being contested for. You know, it's, 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 it's not easy. So we're saying don't be discouraged. If you have the ambition, let your people know you. Go and pick up the form. Raise money. You know, tell us what you want to do for us. Show us your antecedents. What have you done before? Not just talk. What have, what have your actions been? Because, you know, government is not just going to provide all the funds for you once you get into office to do that. If not, everyone will go and do it. So you have to do personal sacrifices. What have you done to, to elect this? And like I said, we want professionals, people who actually have another address, not yeah. full-time politicians, because we know that you have a credible um, source of income, you have a credible, what's it called, resume to come to the job. You have some experience. You can't just tell me that politics is your job. It's, it's really not good enough. All over the world, that's not what obtains, and Nigeria should start doing that. Let's uh, come to you, uh, Taiwo. You know, in deepening in national democracy, uh, every institution plays a significant role. And listening to Dr. Ruki, one of the key things uh, that young Africans will love to know is how can they stay relevant, uh, Taiwo? Uh, there are those uh, uh, I call the blue moon politicians uh, who surface uh, just close to an election. Now, uh, how do you get to warm yourself, you know, to the people, understand, you know, the electoral acts of your country uh, and be more relevant to what you're seeking to do for your people? Okay, so, um, Suleiman, thank you for that question. The truth of the matter is that nothing comes easy. Um, everything in life, you have to fight for it, you have to build your capacity, you have to be ready, and you need to have a vision um, as a young person. Uh, how did I join politics? I joined politics while I was in school. I'm sure most people were aware of where, you know, the, our activism those days during the June 12th struggle. The struggle for the revalidation of the June 12th mandate for Chief M. Abiola. That was how, how, how and when we were introduced into real politics, from fighting for justice, for fighting for you know, revalidation of the June 12th mandate. And of course, this translated even into the banking industry. When I joined banking as a young graduate, I joined National Union of Banks and Financial Institutions employees. And from there, I, I, got, I got some you know, guys, some, young, some men to mentor me on how to, how to play politics, how to serve the people. So young people have to know that you cannot just jump into politics without having mentors, positive mentors that have impacted the society, people that you can regard and be proud to call them as your role model. Because if you go into politics without having a role model, you can make very big mistakes. So for me, I adopted those models and it has paid off. Today, I was not just a, a senior special assistant, I was also given opportunity to manage a very complex World Bank assisted project as a very young man. And I became a chief of staff, which is a very big position in the cabinet of Edison. As at the time, I was, I was regarded as one as the youngest chief of staff in Nigeria. That is the confidence that leaders can have in you. And today, we are still in politics. We are still trying to make impact. We are trying to envision a better Nigeria. But young people need to understand that uh, there has to be that resilience, that confidence, that capacity to know that you can make a difference. I mean, from civil society activism into practical politics, you need to understand what does your people need? How can you, what role can you play in transforming your society from what it is now to a society that you envision for your people? So it's about having that vision. It's about, you know, being in the right team, working with the right set of people. And of course, also identifying, you know, what, you know, identifying the priorities, for your, you know, identifying the priority areas you want to, you know, carve a niche for yourself. For example, I have decided, and this is long ago, that anything that will not impact on the quality of life of people and count me out. And that accounts for why it was easy for me to take certain decisions growing up politically and also being able to identify where I belong. You cannot be everywhere. There are some young people who want to be everywhere. No, you cannot. You have to identify those who, 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 whose vision resonates with your vision, with your philosophy, with your ideology. Your ideology cannot be in line with everybody's ideology. You need to identify those whose ideology res resonates with you, aligns with you, and you need to carve a niche for yourself. And the ability to build your capacity 
all the time is also important. You need to invest in your training. You need to understand, you know, the developmental trajectory of society. You need to understand the manifesto of the political party you need to identify with. There is not every political party manifesto that is related with your personal philosophy. For example, there are the issues of free education, there are issues of gender equality, there are issues of health care. So if all these are not enshrined in the political party that you belong, and that is area that you want to serve, or that is the area you have carved in it for yourself, then you don't have any vision or any, you know, any business. Let, let, let me quickly that, that throw kind of this policy. at you before I come back to the studios. Uh, you, you know, Nigeria as a country for almost 23 years has been on this uh, democratic expedition. Uh, do you think democracy, uh, you know, having been a part and parcel of practical democracy, has been deepened enough uh, to carry everybody along at the moment. Uh, Suleiman, you agree with me that the, uh, this, the African society is used to the kingship system. Um, we are used to having a king as our ruler. We are used to having a one man, you know, that we, 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 we give directive and everybody say car BAC and everybody leaves and uh, carry out the order. And that accounts for why for every time at every time there's military rule or dictatorship, the, the, the legislator is usually the first casualty. Anytime there's a coup d'etat anywhere, the legislature is the first casualty. And that is the representation of the people. That is the, institu that is the institution that actually represents the people's mandate. So for me, uh, it will take time for democracy to actually find its feet in Africa. But I'm very happy for my opening remark. Nigeria has done well in the last 23 years. It's not perfect. We are not yet there. There are so many, you know, issues in, on, in our democracy. You cannot compare it to like America. It's very expensive. If you are not very financially, you know, uh, okay, with all your money, with all your philosophy, with all your ideology, you may not win the vote. You may not win, even when your people understand that you are the best candidate for that position. But at the end of the day, it is the money back that they may vote for. And that has been one of the undermining factors that has actually reduced our democracy to, uh, to, 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 to nothing. But however, um, from what INEC has done, from what the political parties have done, from what the youths have done, civil society, even women, um, from what my colleague has said in the studio, you can see that Nigeria is not where we used to be. Between 1989 and now, a lot has happened. And it shows that if we continue in this trajectory with the periodic review of our electoral reforms, with the you know, mobilization of our people, popular participation and civil society engagement, I have no doubt in my mind that the democracy we see today in Africa, particularly in Nigeria, it will also further improve in the next four, eight, four years to eight years. It's a matter of keeping to faith. It's a matter of rule of law. It's a matter of constitutionalism. It's a matter of ensuring that that rule of law, that constitution, the idea of one man, you know, one man dictating to everything and undermining the, the, the legislature, undermining the judiciary, that culture is completely eliminated. All right, then, Taiwo, the, uh, the just give me a moment. Let me bring in Dr. Ruki here. L listen to Taiwo. What rather that comes to mind is it, it looks like um, politics has, uh, you know, many branches, uh, uh, appointive positions, you know, elective positions, and even, you know, some other uh, things that you can do within your geographical location. As you rightly said, politics is local. So. What are those key things? How can Nigeria improve the viewing of democracy beyond the election? Is it only during election year that politics becomes vibrant? That's when it's most vibrant, like you said. That's when the money bags and, you know, there's hunger in the land. And so every time you bring money, you generate interest of people because they're, they're, they're really poor. But the truth is, it doesn't stop with elections. Okay, if you, if you want to serve, you don't always have, not everyone can occupy a position. For example, how many senators do we have? How many House of Reps members? How many members of the House of Assembly, local government chairman? And these are positions that a lot of people will want, but not everyone can do that. The fact that you can get into elected position doesn't mean you cannot get into an appointed position or even work in the private sector to help people. You know, there's lots of um, non-governmental organizations, lots of charities, that um, some, some people have, and uh, people that want to serve people. Some people say, like you said, politics is too dirty, so I don't want to get involved, but I want to help people. And so they, they go start a charity, raise some money, get some international donors, 
and they go and help the community put water, light, you know, all kinds of things, you know, give subsistence farming, some fertilizers and things like that. The truth is, we can all do something. We okay. can all do something. We can all do something. Everyone can get involved to make it better for the next person. What is the essence of your life? After some time, as a professional, as a successful person, you have enough to eat for yourself and your family. What did you do to impact the neighbor, the environment? What, what will, <coughs> what's it called, posterity say for you on, on your legacy? So, so shouting you're a leader because he held a big position is not necessarily the greatest of all leaders. And many leaders, like you said, get the position and they squander it because they don't even know um, what they need to do because they just want to ha um, have that title. So yes, there's lots of things for us to do. People keep asking me, are you running? And I'm sure you're going to ask me again. And um, the truth is, it's not, it's not as important whether I'm running as my ability to want to serve. She, she, okay. she's, she, she's putting an answer to the question. Yeah, so the I'm saying, comes. I'm saying, I'm I, saying I'll come, that. I'll, come, I'll get there. Yeah. Uh, and it's a question. Well, the truth is, but it's a question, do something. It, it's a question that I'll ask uh, of <laughs> yeah. Taiwo and you all serve. I can yeah. have great young Africans, yeah. you know, with me without asking that. Yeah. But again, quickly, let me bring this in. The gender bills, right. you know, have actually divided opinions in the country. Right. Uh, democracy is believed to be built on, you know, stronger institutions. Why do you think the gender bills were thrown out by the National Assembly? Because there are men there, right? So women cannot vote for women, so men have to vote for women. I'm sure you've had the he for she. Unfortunately for us, um, we have not been properly represented any any sector, not even in the private sector, not even in government. And so that's what we're fighting for, quotas. And in many, many countries, that's how women get thrown off. But, you know, you don't want to give us, they will let women fight like men. To be honest with you, the fact that there's some women in the National Assembly, in the Senate, in the House of Reps, they're not enough, means that it can be done. So women, we are about 50% of the Nigerian population. Vote for women. Women should come out and pick the forms. If they don't want to give us quarters, let's vote for ourselves. Let's support ourselves. Let's, well, well, let's well, get the men well, who well, are sympathetic to Fast forward now, now that, that, now that yes. the bills have been brought back and are being open, you know, We're uh, hoping. To, to, to debate. You've vied. Now, your question is, yeah, finally. You vied for officers as an APC aspirant yes. in the past. Uh, now, do you think your party, the APC, has enough in the area of opening opportunities for youth and women? Absolutely. I think our party is really fighting hard for, for youth and women. I mean, our national youth leaders from Lagos State, you saw him, a vibrant young man. Our woman national leader is a 36-year-old woman. So that tells you what the leaning of the party is. So we're definitely interested in bringing these people on board. Like I said, the laws will help us because it's a very expensive business. And yes, it's a very difficult terrain all over the world for women. I'm sure you know what happened to you. How difficult and painful is it? It's to, very uh, painful. When, when, <laughs> when you asked to stand down, for, because now you talked about the youth leader. And I saw the man, the gentleman, who was asked to stand down uh, for the incumbent, uh, you know, national youth leader. He broke down in tears. Many publicly. people broke down in tears on no, that no, day. No, his was different. Yeah. He was saying that I won't, okay, I'm, I'm pulling out. And he was in tears, he was crying. And I, I felt pain. <laughs> So how, how I join him to go and join whoever won to work with him because he needs help. The fact that I won the election doesn't mean I can do the work alone. That's what I've been saying. So we need to unite to fight. We don't, you don't, not everyone must win. Only one person can emerge a winner. But all of us can work together is what I'm saying. And it's very, very important, especially for women, you know, because we're really marginalized in politics in Nigeria, to understand that we actually have a voice. If we unite behind women and there are men who know the competence of women, no man who is really successful will not have a strong woman in no, his no, house. No, no, so we need women in politics. Women make excellent decisions and they're very easy to rally and they listen and you know, they're more patient in general, just the, ge the general nature of being a woman. And so we need that in Nigerian politics. You can see all over, there's lots of issues currently in Nigeria. So you can imagine it's more competent women. I'm not just saying poor women for the sake of the fact that they're women. Look at the woman. Make sure she can do the job and give her a chance to do the job. If, if we are just, like I said, 
Um, I don't know, like, I'm not, I wasn't in the Senate when we were voting, but I know a lot of senators were very unhappy with how the vote went. But the numbers are the numbers. And so we need to put more women there so that women can fight for women. And that's just it. Let me bring in Tyro quickly here. Uh, Tyro, how can civil societies help improve democracy in Nigeria? Yeah, um, um, Suleiman, before I go, before I answer that question, I think I need to make an input into the women participation in politics. Oh, by all means, go ahead. Yeah, the truth is that there's nothing wrong in women coming out to participate actively in politics. The African traditional social system has not really been supportive of women being active out, outside of their homes over the years. So everybody must understand that we are coming from a system that favors more, that favors men more in public, in the public arena. So we are coming out of a deficit position culturally, socially, and politically when it, when it has to do with women. Even in America, it, up to the 1950s and 1960s, women were not voting, not just blacks. Women were not allowed to vote in the US. And there are still some states to today that discriminate against women in the United States of America. It is now that they are fighting. Nigeria is even making more progress than some states in America when it comes to women empowerment and participation. Look at, for the first time, a black woman is being considered for Supreme Court since 1776 that America got independent. So for me, the, the, the worldwide, over the years, women have always been discriminated against by default. But the flip side of it is that there is an awareness that you cannot continue with this Quickly, kind of can, can you just uh, put, put an answer to your women. question because we're almost out of time now, Tyro. Yeah. So, so, so that brings me up to the issue of civil society. So the civil society has a very significant role to play in mainstreaming gender equality, in mainstreaming popular participation, in engaging the political class, in opening up the political space to ensure that the underserved, the, the, the vulnerable, you know, those who are in the hinterlands, even in terms of political advocacy, polit INE cannot do it alone. So civil society is very important. Even in terms of election monitoring, the political party process monitoring, the, the election, you know, the, the electoral act, you can see the role that the civil society played in the electoral reform. So there's no doubt that the civil society has significant role to play. In fact, they are the fifth estate of the realm after the media. Civil and society, quickly, before we go, because we're out of time now, quickly, uh, uh, quickly, we cannot, Tyro, we cannot uh, emphasize the importance. I, I know we're out of time, Tyro. Uh, Thank you very always much. a delight having you on the show. But quickly here, are you running for any elective position for 2023? Yes, yes, yes. In line with the fact that you cannot sit and allow, you know, charlatans run the electoral process, I have decided to run for the House of Rep in my local, in my, my federal constituency. And, uh, you know, we have started, I've flagged off, and uh, I've identified with the, action, the All Progressive Congress. And, uh, you know, I've gone around the 10 wards, and I'm moving. And the, 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 the support has been very, very, uh, you know, very, very encouraging. And I, I'm very happy that I'm going to come back here to tell you that I've won the we, primary. We, 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 we'll, we'll look forward to having you come back because we, we have a, a special that we'll be doing about knowing your candidate here on New Centre Television. We should have you uh, give us okay. a talk on that. And quickly, uh, Dr. Ruki, are you running? Thank you very much. Um, the short answer is I'm still consulting. Okay, you know I ran for the House of Reps the last elections and uh, unfortunately I didn't win but my party won. So we are very strong in our side. I'm central, Delta Central. You know the deputy senior president is also from Central. So in Delta State currently, two out of three senators are from APC. So yeah, we fancy our chances. Um, like I said, <laughs> politics is, um, is not only elected positions. I, I can tell you straight away that I'm running or not running because I'm still consulting. And uh, we just reached our convention, uh, so I, 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 I love the consultation yes, part. Yes. It's one of the key <laughs> things that I think we should have both of you come back and talk more so that people can get, uh, you know, schooled uh, about politics in Nigeria and other parts of the continent. I'd like to say thank you for being such nice company, Dr. Ruki Ogumbe and Taiwo Akirali. And Sulaiman, uh, later, many thanks for watching. I'll catch you again on the square. <laughs>